Blueprint, Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmail, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Broadcasting once again live from my constituency office in Lindsay, Ontario. Once again, please remember, like, comment, share, subscribe. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. And not only can you connect with us over Facebook and watch the podcast, you can also hear it audio-wise through platforms like Spotify, Google, CastBox, etc. So help us, again, push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. There is lots for us to talk about. We have an amazing show once again lined up for you. In the second half, we have the Honorable Michelle Rempel garner a fan favorite. She's from Calgary Nose Hill, and she's also the Shadow Minister for Industry and Economic Development. We're going to talk about her plan and the Conservatives' plan to connect rural Canadians by 2021. That is something that many Canadians are dealing with right now, the lack of connectivity. It's happening in my riding especially, so that's going to be a very interesting conversation. We also have coming up now another Albertan, John Barlow. He has been on the show many times, and we appreciate him coming back. He's the Member of Parliament for Foothills in the beautiful, great province of Alberta. He's also the Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you once again, John Barlow, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Always a pleasure. And I see you're in Ottawa, so you are ready for question period, in-person question period tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be, unfortunately, going to have to put a suit on. But, uh, you know, looking forward to getting back out there and, and uh, you know, standing up for, for agriculture and our processors and producers across Canada. Well, let's talk about the aid package or so-called aid package announced by the federal government. The Canadian Federation of Agriculture laid out about a six, or sorry, a $2.6 billion ask to help farmers right across this country dealing with COVID-19, and they barely got $252 million. So maybe we can start with that. Yeah, it's certainly uh, disappointing, um, underwhelming, uh, and frustrating for producers, uh, processors, farmers uh, across this country uh, who are looking uh, for some some crumbs of, of showing that they are uh, respected and an important cog in our in our economy, and and I think this just goes to show um, that the liberals don't look at agriculture and certainly uh, the security of our food supply as a priority. Uh, and when you look at uh, you know less than 10 percent of what was requested by the industry is a pretty uh, a pretty strong statement on how they feel about uh, rural economies. So another disturbing part of this report that we're hearing from a number of groups, including the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, is that almost or up to 15 percent, maybe more, maybe less of farms might go under because of the COVID-19 crisis and the lack of action by this government. Yeah, it's a huge uh, and startling number. You know, you back up a little bit. Uh, in 2018, we saw the largest drop um, of revenue to, in Canadian agriculture in Canada's history, 45% drop. So going into this, uh, Canadian agriculture, as a result, for in many cases, of political blunders and bad policy by the Liberal government, anywhere from a carbon tax to illegal blockades to lost um, foreign market access, agriculture was coming into this pandemic on a very shaky financial footing. And this has just made things worse and exasperated that. So to lose 15% of our farms, that's 30,000 family farms that are at risk of bankruptcy. And what we're, gonna, what we're asking the Liberal government, do you understand the implications of this? Do you know what the ramifications on our food supply or the price of groceries on the store shelves will be if we lose 30% or 30,000 family farms? Um, our, our food supply is at risk. Uh, and not to mention the devastation this would have on rural economies across this country. And we've talked many times before about the the importance and, and just the, the common sense about a country that's able to feed themselves. And as you mentioned, 30,000 potential farms going bankrupt. That, to me, is really scary, especially coming from a riding that the number one economic driver is agriculture. Certainly, mine would be very much the same in southwest Alberta. My the economy in my area is, is definitely based uh, based in agriculture. Uh, you know, as many of our stakeholders have said, this is like the Liberals standing by and watching the farmhouse burn to the ground and offering a bottle of water as assistance. Um, they need to understand 
uh, the critical situation facing agriculture. Um, and it's very clear that either A, uh, they don't understand um, agriculture and rural economies, or B, they don't care. Uh, and either one is, uh, is a frightening statement on this current situation that f farm families are facing right now. I think you put it well in the context before, just leading up to this. Uh, 2019, of course, was was a bad year weather wise for a lot of farmers uh, dealing with beef prices that that weren't where they're supposed to be. We've had rail blockades causing problems with shipments and grain getting to certain places to market. We've had issues with with China not taking their pork, then taking our pork and, uh, you know, uh, getting our, our 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 cash crop across. Um, this is this has just been a steamroll effect that now, as you said, this COVID-19 crisis hits and farmers have used a lot of their equity up already. Yeah, exactly. You know, whether it's it's AgriInvest or uh, different programs that they've had some savings put aside, they've definitely, many of them have dipped into that and, and are now, uh, the biggest thing that we are seeing from the Liberals is they're just offering more debt, you know, more loans, whether that's Farm Credit Canada or uh, Advanced Payment Program. Farmers can no longer uh, take on that that debt burden. They are already, um, you know, their 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 credit is is maxed out as it is. They they can't take on that additional those additional debts. And you know that has started years ago, um, when it started with those small business tax changes from the Liberals. Uh, you know, five billion dollars in lost markets, whether that's you know canola to China, wheat to Italy, uh, peas and pulses to India. You know, the, all of these things are. You know, just another punch to the gut, and then you have this past year one of the worst harvests we've had in our history. Uh, then a CN strike, which the Liberals did nothing. Then you have illegal blockades, which again the Liberals did nothing. And then on April first, you increase the carbon tax, which is just yet another uh, slap in the face. You know, during a global pandemic, what economist would possibly recommend increasing taxes on an, es an essential service, which you are going to be relying on. And I think the frustrating part of this is coming out of COVID, there are going to be incredible opportunities for Canadian agriculture. There are countries like Russia, Kazakhstan, Vietnam have closed their borders. They are not exporting wheat, barley. That is leaving huge voids in global markets that Canadian agriculture can fill. But first, you have to worry about feeding ourselves and making sure that our own supply chain is intact before you start looking outside of the globe. But you also have to ensure that we are a trusted source. You have to have reliable infrastructure, reliable labor, um, you know, all of these things that the Liberals have systematically uh, torn down in our Canadian supply chain. And that's really frustrating when you see some opportunities that are there, um, but you're being handcuffed by government policy. Before I unpack more about the path forward and how you think and our party thinks and using conservative principles, how we move agriculture into the future and make it uh, prosperous and a place where we want young people to continue to go to to take a, take over the family farm. Just quickly go back to the carbon tax. As the federal government is literally blowing billions of dollars out the door as fast as they can get it, they're increasing taxes, meaning the carbon tax, where I was reading an article from a Saskatchewan newspaper, some farmers are losing up to 10% of their margin in in the carbon tax and already the margins are tight and farmers don't always have a mechanism to capture that loss and increase prices or, or find it elsewhere. That's right. You know, producers are, are price takers. They cannot pass on those costs to anyone else. So uh, when they are absorbing those increased taxes, um, they have nowhere else to go. And as you said, you know, it's we've seen numbers anywhere from, you know, four to ten dollars an acre, depending on on the size of your operation. Uh, but C uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business has done a survey. Uh, they the results that they have is about uh, on the average farm it's about fourteen thousand dollars a year. Um, that is that is you know in many cases their profit margin uh, or their their margins are so tight that is making their their operations unsustainable. Uh, you know I've got a a grain operator in the southern part of my riding who had a two point five million dollar contract to sell grain to Qatar. Uh, but with the carbon tax, his price is no longer globally competitive. So he lost that contract to other global competitors. So it's not just the impact it's having here on the ground, but it's having an impact on our competitiveness around the world. So um, these costs, and it, when we talk about this $14,000 per farm, it doesn't include 
um, the guy hauling their fertilizer, the guy hauling their grain, uh, the trucker hauling their uh, fuel, all of those costs are also being passed on. Uh, we've now seen a report from CN and CP that the carbon tax that they are charging and being passed on to uh, farm families is about $25 million a year. Uh, all of these costs are adding up and adding up and making uh, Canadian agriculture unsustainable. And to see this tax increase on April 1st is just unfathomable. So Canadian agriculture is getting tougher and tougher to, to make money and to get by and raise your family as a farmer. So we want to be a nation that is, is able to feed ourselves. And I think that's where we need to go and, and, and stress. But how do you get younger farmers into the trade when the chances of making money get more difficult every single year? Yeah, you know, we want uh, young, young Canadians to see agriculture as uh, uh, a career choice, as a, a viable opportunity for them. Uh, so I think there are some ways that we can we can do that. Uh, certainly, uh, instead of punishing Canadian farmers with a farm killing carbon tax, give them credit uh, for the conservation and stewardship uh, that they are doing, uh, whether that's soil, water, gra gra grazing land, all of those things that, uh, that they should be getting credit for rather than being punished for. Talk about the incredible sophisticated technology that's on farms, uh, you know, robotics, GPS, precision farming, all of these things that young people would find uh, extremely interesting and maybe they don't realize, but also make it uh, some tax incentives there for them uh, to ensure that it's easier to pass that family farm on to the next generation rather exactly. than as liberals tried to do, make it more difficult, easier exactly. to sell it to a corporation than onto your own, uh, onto your own, uh, you know, daughter, son, nephew, niece, or whoever that, that next but person. But big government likes that. Big government sure. would rather just a few conglomerates controlling the whole agriculture sector rather than a whole bunch of these family farms. For big right. government it loves big power. Maybe they would like to nationalize nationalize agriculture, and you know maybe that's why they won't tell us the the data behind the carbon tax. We've asked, you know, what what does the carbon tax cost Canadian farmers? And the answer to my order paper question was that secret. So for a government that talks about science based decisions uh, and open and transparent. Uh, apparently, there are national security secrets behind the cost of a carbon tax that they can't pass on to farmers, which is... Well, I don't uh, want Canadians to know the truth, for sure. That's right. We're talking about trade. Obviously, we produce more than we consume in a lot of cases. Let's talk about these markets. There are markets all across this planet that are ripe for Canadian agriculture and Canadian technology as well, the genetic sector, mm -hmm. everything that goes with it. Um, I, I think there... I agree with you, John. There are tremendous opportunities to not only boost the the uh, the margins of farmers to give them more uh, access to other countries, but where our uh, department, like the CFIA, for example, should be more of a helpful agency rather than a barrier or a, a block to competition and trade. Absolutely. I think we, through this uh, process, we've, we've seen that we need to focus on uh, increased capacity, uh, whether that's in the proteins or in canola. Uh, we, we can't have uh, just a few processing plants um, in operation that, that, that leaves us very vulnerable, which we've, we've learned from this. Uh, but we also have to ensure that our regulatory and tax regime is competitive. Uh, we are seeing innovation and technology go to other countries, whether that's new seed varieties, new uh, you know, farming or pest management products, things like that, be developed in other countries because they can't get it done here in Canada. So we should be exporting our products, which are produced um, under the most stringent um, environmental regime in the world. We have world-class products. Quality is never the problem. But we should also be exporting our best and brightest, the technology and innovation that we've created here at home. Uh, and unfortunately, because of tax regulations and regulatory burdens, they, that's, we've been unable to take advantage of those opportunities, which is really holding back Canadian agriculture. I think that's a good point uh, to make. Canada has some of the best quality food anywhere in the world. We just need the ability to get it to other markets, which uh, has been in some cases a challenge for, for some farmers. And I know the previous Conservative government started that ball rolling and we, we hope obviously the goal is to e open up even more markets on a, on a, a trade basis. Yeah, for sure. We, you know, going into government, uh, Prime Minister Harper, we had about four free trade agreements with four different countries. Now we, after Prime Minister Harper, we had more than 50. 
uh, that's a huge difference uh, for Canadian producers. We more than 50% of what we produce, we uh, export. But to see going backwards, losing those uh, those markets, uh, and seeing some of our most trusted trading partners uh, look elsewhere. Uh, is really difficult for our producers to take because the Canadian brand is respected around the world. They know it's a quality product. It is in huge demand. Uh, other countries are willing to pay a premium price for Canadian products because they know what they're getting. Uh, but when you have um, things out, side of the producer's control, like government blunders that are costing us these markets, that is really difficult to take because farmers understand there's lots of variables outside of the control of their commodity prices. Um, but there are some things they rely on government to be able to be uh, to have in in their corner, and that is you know trade markets, reliable infrastructure to get their products to market. Now, I'd be remiss, John, if I didn't mention the uh, beef processing plant. I believe in your riding that's dealing with an outbreak of COVID-19. Maybe can you give us a quick update? Is everything okay? I, I know obviously we're we're thinking lots about the workers who have contracted the virus. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Jamie. Yeah, uh, Cargill uh, Meat Solutions in High Rivers in, in my hometown where my office is, and it's been a very difficult time uh, for our community. We've had uh, close to a thousand employees at Cargill uh, have the COVID test positive for COVID-19. Thankfully, um, they've all recovered for the most part, but uh, there have been a, a couple of fatalities, which is really unfortunate. Uh, and certainly, um, the health and safety of those employees is uh, of the utmost importance. They are so critical to our our economy, but also important parts of our community. And and to those uh, employees in the food processing industry, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, we'll, we're asking Canadians every day to stay home and stay safe. Um, people in the agriculture sector, including food processing, are going to work every single day. Uh, to ensure that we have food on our tables and our grocery store shelves are well stocked. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for everything that you are doing. And you are an essential service and a frontline worker. And uh, certainly our, our thoughts are with uh, with the employees at Cargill and High River. Excellent. Well said, John. And, and a perfect note to let you go. I know you're busy, but I do appreciate your time. And once again, for coming on the show and talking about Canadian agriculture and the value of it. Well, it's a real pleasure, Jamie. Thanks for ha having me. And it's, uh, I'm glad I had to go before Michelle because that is a tough act to follow. <laughs> well, thank you very much, John Barlow, the Member of Parliament for Foothills. He's also the Shadow Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. We appreciate his time and his conversation about the state of agriculture in Canada. As mentioned, coming up is the Honourable Michelle Rempel garner She is the Shadow Minister of Industry and Economic Development. We're going to talk to her momentarily in just a few minutes about the plan, the Conservative plan to connect rural Canadians by 2021. So remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.
Welcome back to part two of the Blueprint, Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton for the Lakes Brock. Once again, broadcasting live from Lindsay, Ontario. That's the location of my constituency office. We had John Barlow on the first half of the show to talk about agriculture in Canada. And so I ask, as always, that you like, share, subscribe, comment to this program, help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. So in the second half, we have a fan favorite, the Honourable Michelle Rempelgarner. She's a member of Parliament for Calgary, Nose Hill, two back-to-back Albertans. She's also the Shadow Minister of Industry, Economic Development. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us once again on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, we're going to talk about a pretty cool document. It's called Connect Canada. I don't know if that's coming through on the camera okay. But it's about a plan to launch a consultation process and get rural Canada connected by 2021. Tell us a bit about it. That is awesome news. Well, there's so many people across Canada who don't have even the most basic access to the Internet. And this isn't a luxury. This is a key integral part of life. This is something that every Canadian needs to participate in the economy. And I worry about it because it's it's a barrier to equality of opportunity for a lot of Canadians. It also is exacerbating the urban and rural divide that we see in our country. So I think what, you know, the COVID crisis has done is really underscore how acute this issue is, because I'm sure you hear it about it in your constituency, Jamie, just people that just it's like, okay, we'll work from home or, you know, make your farm more productive or something. It's like, well, I have one bar of 3G, so that's not going to happen. So we spent a lot of time as a caucus. I know you and others participated in this as well to put together concrete recommendations for the Liberal government. There's 14 in this document about if they're implemented, we feel like we could get the, the country connected in a year's time. This is really important because the Liberals have said, after being in power for six years, that they intend to do something by 2030. And if you think about that, when they first set this aspirational target, it was two years ago, that's a 12 year period. And like, if you think about it 12 years ago, like Facebook wasn't a thing. Our lives have changed so much. And I just find it completely like irrational for them to think that it's acceptable for 2030 to be the time where rural Canadians I uh, get a fair shake at this. Crazy. Well, there are many third world countries that have better internet and cellular service than we do here in Canada. Absolutely. I think waiting that long is just ridiculous. So the CRTC uh, said uh, more than five years ago that uh, Canadians in rural and remote regions uh, need to have this. It's an essential service. And the benchmark is, according to your notes here, 50 megabytes per second download and 10 upload. Yep. And uh, right now, I know in my area, there's large portions of it that you're lucky to get one bar uh, at all. So, uh, you know, for a rural area like mine that want to capture a seasonal audience, the cottagers that come up from mainly the greater Toronto area, keeping them here for an extra day, maybe on the Friday or the Monday, they need to work from their cottage. And that means internet or cellular service. And, and that's why it's so important for economic activity as well in rural areas. Absolutely. And it's, 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 it's not just cottagers. It's not just people that live there that want to, you know, homeschool their kids or work from home. It's, it's businesses in these communities. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's such a gap. Um, And, you know, it was great to see the conservative party has a lot of people who represent rural Canada, but we had many colleagues um, that participated in this process. So I feel like it's a, it's a document that's not, you know, it's not written by any of the big telcos, it's not written by any of the service providers, it's not written by academics, it's written by people who have worked with their communities and subject matter experts to come up with concrete recommendations to change the status quo. The status quo is not working, the status quo has never worked to get us uh, rural internet. And I think that we need to recognize that and move forward. I, I also want to give credit, like, um, one of our new caucus colleagues, Jamie, um, his name is Jeremy Patzer. You know him from Saskatchewan. He's actually got a 10-year background in telecommunications. He helped put this together. Um, Dan Mazur from Manitoba. I, I'm just, I, I really encourage people to read it because I'm hoping that it gets some nonpartisan traction um, and that the Liberals will actually adopt it. But very, very common sense recommendations. I think if, if the average Canadian read it, they're like, yep, we should be doing this. Right away. Well, I, I think a good part of this talks about competition 
And yes. in, in, on conservative principles, competition makes everything better. You get a better service, a better price, uh, you get more selection. And, and this is something we don't have in Canada. Whereas you look, even our neighbors to the south, there is lots of competition and their bills are a heck of a lot lower than ours. So the we pay five times more than an American does for data. Five times more. We pay 10 times more than a European for data. That is the, the figures that come out of like civil society groups uh, in Canada often. Now, um, some of the, uh, you know, the big players in, in the space provide who provide internet, they'll argue with that. But the reality is, is that oftentimes we will see the top end speeds or what is theoretically possible being advertised as the product. Whereas in reality, what you actually get is like the you know, very slow data transfer rates. And that makes things like what you and I are doing here virtually impossible, right? So, you know, if you look through the document, this is where we've got beyond the recommendations on competition and spectrum and we've got all these technical recommendations. We have things like accurate reporting, transparency with Canadians and accountability. So consumers should have real-time information available to them on their speed and bandwidth. We have a whole recommendation on this. Simple consumer contracts. So that, like, look, Jamie, at the end of the day, I strongly feel that access to the internet, it's not a luxury. I actually think it's becoming, you could even describe it as a public good, as the same way that we would a road. You don't have econ stable economies without access to a business via a road. Why are we even having this argument about the internet in this day and age? So thanks for letting me rant about this. <laughs> and I hope that your listeners will, regardless of where they live, We'll understand that it's not acceptable. And this is a problem in urban Canada, too, by the way. Absolutely. But you're absolutely right. Even if you're talking about healthcare, now that we're dealing with COVID-19, we're doing a lot more by internet. Healthcare, we can do education. The list yep. just goes on and on and on. But it's a huge barrier in rural areas and some urban centers um, if there isn't that, that service available. And a lot of the junior partners, like many industries, when big companies get too powerful and they lobby big government and big government loves a whole just a select few, um, it's hard for the juniors to, whether it be mining or, or in telecommunications, it's hard for them to, to get off the ground. And, and they can provide that service just as well as some of the big people, but the barriers are there impeding that progress. I, absolutely. You know, you just nailed it. We've got a lot of that sort of description of what the historical problems have been in terms of building out access in Canada, both from a regulatory perspective, a policy perspective in Canada in that document. And uh, it's on my website, mprumple.ca. I think it's on the party aid's website as well too. Um, but I just encourage people to, to read it. Um, and then if they have feedback, you know, you talked about this being a consultation process on, on how we can improve things. We want to hear from them so that we can be using that to push back. I mean, you know, you and I haven't even touched about things like uh, First Nation communities, right? Many First Nations communities, yeah. not only don't they have access to the internet, they don't have access to clean drinking water. But why are we, like, why aren't we addressing this in a way such that every Canadian, what I would love to see, Jamie, is that the hardest to reach Canadian has access within, you know, like a maximum two year period. We built a railway across Canada well over a hundred years ago in a, in a relatively short period of time. Surely we can figure out how to get internet access to every Canadian and we need to be bold and innovative and not just look to the past and existing systems to get it done. So as we think differently, you have some thoughts maybe you'd like to share about spectrum options and how we can maybe do that differently. Yeah, so for people who don't understand what spectrum is, it's Okay, I'm an economist, so please forgive me if I completely bungle this analogy. <laughs> but it's essentially the bandwidth or the stuff that allows uh, internet to work. I'm sure somebody will give me like great degree of grief for for that super dumb it works for me. <laughs> explanation. But access to that has been controlled by the government, and rightly so, so that um, it, it functions properly and that the government, it, it's a public good that the government can get some benefit from it. So what's happened in the past is that the government has auctioned this spectrum off, but what will end up happening is that only a few players in the country actually have the ability to buy it, and then they end up hoarding it, okay? So they don't use the whole thing. 
And what that means functionally is that more competition or smaller service providers can't get in and use that in order to provide access to harder to reach communities, point number one. Point number two, there's also a sort of a concept that's not exactly related, but close about facilities-based competition, which is that um, essentially a, a big provider in Canada has to, has to build out the, the towers and the, and the hardware to like provide services. In other countries around the world, both the spectrum auctioning process and that facilities-based use concept look differently. So for in the, US, the UK, for example, um, if, if, if a company owns the poles and the hardware, mm -hmm. they are not allowed to sell service, right? Because it removes that disincentive to monopolize the space, right? Spectrum auction is the same thing. I, I think that we're at a point in our country's history where we should be saying, well, maybe we're not, the government's not selling or using this 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 asset in the best possible way. And what's really neat is there seems to be sort of cross-partisan acknowledgement that this is the case. Now, this gives some of the you know players in the space that have traditionally operated and on this status quo existing a great degree of consternation. My message to them would be, um, let's work together. So rather than just putting all the efforts in defending the status quo, let's admit that it's not working. Uh, in terms of access to the Canadian public and work together for change. Um, so we'll see if, you know, politicians in this space have enough courage to continue that message because there's a lot of pressure on people to not talk about it. But at the end of the day, what you and I are managing to as legislators is access. Canadians need access for productivity and equality. And that's what I want to see happen. So I remember when Stephen Harper was prime minister and and you were a minister in the cabinet, there was talk about letting more competition in, specifically it was mentioned Verizon, for example, which is a big player in the United States that could, has the capacity uh, to come in and, and make an impact. And the big mm -hmm. telcos uh, almost had a, a heart attack, jumping up and down, yelling and screaming about this, but obviously they're, pro, they're protecting uh, their monopoly. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't wanna make any company out to be a villain one way or the other. I will say this, the regulatory environment in Canada, when it comes to telecommunications, does not incent competition. I know that you know the telcos will be like, "Oh yeah, it totally does." It doesn't. It like it doesn't. And I, I, I just, I can't accept that we have to. That the Canadians have to sacrifice access to a, a service that's just so important, or pay rates that are so much more expensive than other parts of the world um, because a few you know, companies control the media and they control access to the space through the regulatory environment. I think everybody just needs to tone it down a notch and say that while yes, we want companies to be making money and we want people to be, you know, we want a, a free market space, the government also has a role to ensure access to Canadians because we're, we're losing productivity because of this people, there's inequalities because of this. And that's our role as government to address. So I've started, you know, I know I've ruffled feathers. Um, I, but if you, you, you can't affect change if you don't ruffle feathers. And what's been really neat to watch is our caucus and our party kind of start pushing back against some of this narrative and saying, you know what, stuff needs to change. And, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation on your podcast today. I think it's a step in the right direction. Well, I also want to point out the, the, the liberal plan that they campaigned on in the platform. It was reduced their cell phone bills by, I think, 10 or 15 percent or something. Without competition, now, I just want to point out, without competition, the big telcos are just going to make some packages optional. You're still going yeah. to pay that. It may not come off the, the top end, but you're still going to pay it somehow, some way, because there is no competition. There's no incentive for these companies to lower bills. Yeah, I um, like, look, I, I think that we have to start looking at really bold ideas, you know, and I know that this will create like a pucker factor in certain quarters. But why aren't we looking at the UK model of separating out infrastructure from service provision so that there's an incentive to deliver deliver better, faster service, right? Why aren't we looking, like, I mean, what, how, that wouldn't really cost the government much, and it would probably make the government build out of infrastructure a lot more efficient. Um, but that's a spicy idea in Canada. It's like, oh, we can't do that. She's crazy. I, 
I don't, I really think that if we can't talk about somebody in your writing having access to the internet in a meaningful way such that they can participate in the economy, healthcare, education, we're the ones who are derelict. And I, like, so for the liberals to be like, yeah, everything's okay. We're going to lower things by 10% magically and but not get access until 20. Like, that is the wrong conversation. So, you know, if liberal colleagues are watching this, I think the NDP kind of get it. They, uh, their industry critic, he's, he's pretty cool on this file. Even the block, um, they're great on, on actually on this file. I think there's consensus building across party lines that something needs to change, except within the liberal party. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I just encourage everybody of all political stripe to just push, push on the government and say, look, what's working, um, what, what's, what's happening right now doesn't work. We need change. Well, one last thing I will ask you about is each generation that comes out, whether it be 3G, 4G, there's always been some disruption in the economy, whether yes. it be new opportunities, what have you, such as meal sharing, ride sharing, uh, you know, different platforms to get a rental unit. Um, so we, we, I think this conversation also needs to happen as, as, we, as our economy changes, as the internet changes. Absolutely. And like when you talk about G, like 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, G stands for generation. And all that it means, all that means is the, the latency speed. So um, and that means the time it takes from data to connect from your device to the Internet and back. And as that speed decreases, you can have more functionality. Right. So from 3G to 4G, the, for example, you had streaming services like Netflix. Um, Uber Eats, these sorts of things, because that data latency had re reduced so much that that those types of services were possible. And the next generation of technology will further reduce. Um, let's say it takes you 10 minutes to download a feature length film on Netflix right now. The next generation of technology that's being emerged uh, is merging. That latency will be like one second. So that's going to transform the economy as well, too. And if we can't figure out how to get Internet to people, <laughs> Like the world's just going to pass us by on productivity. It'll become a determinant to economic growth, job creation in Canada. And we can't accept that. But Jamie, you haven't talked about your town hall. I've heard rumors that you're having this crazy, amazing town hall <laughs> in like a week that I might tune into. So I'm going to interview you. I want to hear about it so that you don't forget to tell your viewers about this awesome town hall that's happening. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, you're right. I, I had... Uh unfortunately forgot about that. So on Wednesday, May 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern time, I ha am having the one and only Honorable Michelle Rempel Garner and Jeremy Patzer, our colleague from Saskatchewan, to talk about this plan, to talk about ideas and to make a, a genuine discussion about the path forward. So I thank you very much. You can register for it. It's, it's open to anyone at jamieschmale.ca. That's Wednesday, May 20th, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And I thank you, Michelle, for bringing that because I was going to forget about that. And I forgot about John Barlow. I'm having him on tonight on a town hall to talk about agriculture. I totally forgot to mention that. Uh, that's at 8 p.m. tonight, Eastern time. And, You're working uh, so wow, hard. That, that is shame on me. Not at all. <laughs> Any parting words, Michelle? Thank you so much for doing this. And for everybody who's watching, you know, if this is an issue that's important to you, read that document. As Jamie said earlier, share, you know, share this content, comment on it. Um, if you're in Jamie's writing or any other writing, write to your MP, give them your thoughts so that we can push this issue and get some action sooner than later. Thank you so much. The Honorable Michelle Rempel Gardner, the Member of Parliament from Calgary, Nose Hill, two Albertans back to back on this program. Wow. I, I, our friends in the East Coast, I think, uh, will need uh, some representation next time, but uh, we'll, we'll fix that. Michelle's also the uh, Shadow Minister for Industry and Economic Development. Thank you, Michelle. I know you're busy. I do appreciate your time. Have a great day. So once again, a like, subscribe, comment, share, help us push back against the liberal agenda. Watch it here on Facebook. Listen to it on platforms like Spotify, CastBox, Google, iTunes, you name it. It's out there. We're working to push back against the liberal agenda. So thank you once again for joining us. We'll be back next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time to talk about the issues facing you as Canadians as we all go through COVID-19 together. And as always, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprints. Thanks for joining us.